You're listening to WSUW, The Edge in Whitewater, Wisconsin. This is Rashkin Report, and I'm your host, Yuri Rashkin. I'm excited to welcome to the program uh, Ben Wisenhut, a professor of history at uh, DuPage, DuPage College. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Glad to be with you. So if you could uh, start by sharing what is the reason for your interest in the, in the distant, faraway land uh, of Russia? You're not from Russia. No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> I was born in the United <laughs> States, but um, I'm a professor of history, and my major field is is Russian history. And currently, I've been researching and writing a lot more about um, Russian-American relations. And um, it's it's a timely subject these days because of the relations you see in the news. But um, we, a group of us, are trying to give some more historical context to what's going on um, in Russia today by doing more historical work about the uh, the past relationship. That's fantastic. And uh, it sounds like you've got a couple of interesting projects that we can uh, discuss. Yes. So th- the first one that kind of came to my attention is this new journal on American-Russian relations. And uh, uh, this is something that I heard through Facebook or through Professor Ivan Kurila, a past guest on this show. And um, he actually, in his Facebook post also, maybe yesterday, without any sort of reference to this project, was uh, talking about uh, how when you say things to Americans and to Russians, uh, th- there's a different messages that have to be sent because there's certain things that Americans need to and should know about Russia, and there's certain things that Russians should know about America. And if you do those messages in the wrong language, it will seem like you're saying very basic things sometimes. Um, what what are the things that you feel are important for American audiences to understand and learn about Russia? Well, I think the first thing to understand about Russia is that Russia is not one place. I think for a long time, certainly in the post-Soviet time, the past 25 years, but even before that, when I got started in this, uh, working on this in the, in the 1980s, is that it always seems to be a conclusion reached by Americans that there's sort of one Russia, and that Russia or the Soviet Union in the old days was sort of one monolithic place. And I think what people come to discover when they look at Russia more carefully um, is that Russia is an extremely diverse place with lots of different um, beliefs and attitudes about the world. And one of the chief problems in understanding, I think, not just, not just Russia, but lots of, part, lots of parts of the world, is that we try to simplify things down into sort of, sort of what do the Russians think and what do the Americans think. And I don't think that that... that uh, approach is very um, useful, and I and I, I know Ivan uh, quite well, and he and I have been working on um, conferences together for the past uh, maybe almost ten years now. And this is something we we talk a lot about: is that um, the cultural context and how we talk to each other, and how we even address the other um, in language use sometimes um, can be critically important. True. So you feel that uh, Russia is more than one country, and what what impact does it have for, let's say, either policymakers or average Americans? Well, as a historian, I think one of the things that troubles us when we look at policymakers or current people dealing with current relations is that it doesn't have a very historical sort of approach. They don't seem to know much about what the relations were like in the past, whether good or bad or sort of maybe even indifferent. And I think that um, one of the things we're trying to do with our new projects is sort of is show that they are, um, there's a variety of views and there's more depth to it. I think sometimes what happens is, is these conversations become quite superficial. And I think people have to understand that there's, there's a quite, a, uh, quite a depth to the relationship that goes back to the 18th century. Uh, the Journal of Russian American Studies. What kind of materials uh, do you have? Some submissions? Do you know what you're going to be publishing in a first issue, or when, how far along is this project at this point? Um, this project started um, with an email I sent <laughs> um, last May or May of this year, and we have organized it now to where it's being hosted by the University of Kansas Libraries, and it'll be an online only journal that'll be referee journal. Um, like any other you know, academic journal. And we are now putting together the first issue, and the first issue should be out in April of 2017. And right now we have roughly five articles that we're, we're working with, as well as book reviews, and um, probably about five book reviews as well. 
And um, in the articles, what we're going to do in this first issue in particular is try to um, have articles that establish what we call sort of the state of the field. So what is Russian-American relations um, as an academic field? Who studies these sort of things? And um, where does it stand now in 2016, 2017? Um, we plan on publishing two issues a year. Um, so our second one will come out in the fall of 2017, which coincides almost exactly with the centennial of the Russian Revolution. And so we hoped in that uh, edition or that issue we'll have a themed volume, a themed issue on uh, Americans and the Russian revolutionary experience. Uh, Professor Wisenhut, I think it sounds like a fascinating uh, thing to take a look at simply because as, as I'm doing my show, I'm seeing that there are certain individuals here, certain individuals there, but there are conferences that people go to and, uh, um, you know, what is your general uh, feeling for the field? Do you feel it is growing? Do you feel it is about to grow? Is that a field? I mean, it's been a field, uh, you know, Sovietology that's been in decline uh, for years prior, but now thanks to Mr. Putin, um, Russia is a hot item again. It does seem that way. And the irony of this story is, is that I was in graduate school in the early, early to mid 1990s as this, as sort of Sovietology certainly was, was fading um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. But what I think we see now is um, hopefully a return to looking at more serious scholarship from the um, on the history and the cultural relations between the two countries going back to the 18th century to help f create a more nuanced and uh, specific kind of view of each other. And I think that um, hopefully we're, we're going to help craft that in some ways. As far as the field being large or small, um, it's a field that doesn't have a home. So um, most of us who are involved in this project are, and these all these projects that, I'm talk, that we're working on, are attend typically a Slavic studies conference that is annually uh, held every year. Um, but the American side to this is less um, robust. So if you go to an American history conference, there's less about Russia. If you go to this, these Russian history conferences, there's there's more about the American relationship. So it's something that we're trying to to forge ahead on. Um, in an academic way to bring more people into this and to um, continue to expand it beyond what was once known as sort of the Sovietology of the, the late Cold War period. Uh, just one more clarification question on the journal. Mm -hmm. it, you say it's going to be hosted uh, by University of Kansas Libraries. Mm -hmm. Is that something that anyone will be able to access just by knowing where to go, or is that something behind like a paywall, or how does that work? No, it's all free and open access. So these these online journals, which are continue to emerge in many places around the world, um, all have different rules and restrictions on them about when you can see articles, if you have to pay for them, and these sorts of things. But our agreement with the University of Kansas is this will be an open access journal from the very instant it's posted. So I believe, if I do this right in April, <laughs> that um, when I post the material there, the articles and book reviews, they should be available around the world um, instantly in PDF files. So there'll be in the, there's a web address for it. If you Google or if you search for Journal of Russian American Relations, it does come up. Uh, but there's also a web address I can give you as well. Go ahead. It's um, https colon um, journals dot ku dot edu backslash jras. You're listening to WSUW 91.7 FM in Whitewater, Wisconsin, The Edge. Uh, this is Rashkin Report, and I'm your host, Yuri Rashkin. Uh, on this program, I'm joined by uh, Dr. Ben Wisenhunt, Professor of History, College of DuPage, and we're discussing uh, some of the new and upcoming exciting projects that Professor is working on. Um, Professor, you're saying uh, that uh, your goal is to increase the understanding um, of of the relations and get a better understanding that Russia is not one country, that it is complex. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out, are you looking at this as an understanding of 
the friendliness that Russia is? You know, what's the bigger theme? Or is it the threat? Or is it, you know, what should we be seeing more clearly that we're not seeing? Because, you know, just saying that it's complex, it, it's kind of, um, it also lacks cl- complexity by definition, lacks clarity. But understanding presumes that there's going to be clarity. So that's what I'm confused by. If you could kind of tell me what your, what your thoughts are. Is this understanding or the complexity? Um, I think it's probably a little bit of both, but I think that um, what I mean by that is, is when we see news reports today about things in Russia, or perhaps about Vladimir Putin himself, um, I think sometimes in the short amount of space that's given in a television broadcast or in, you know a, a news story in a, online or in print form, is that sometimes Putin comes off as almost a caricature of something that we imagine, and I think that's. Um, and, and and I think sometimes we don't necessarily understand, as Americans, most understand most Americans don't understand ex- exactly um, how Russians view him. So when I travel to Russia, I get a wide ra- you know, range of views about America and about Russia and about Putin and even about internal matters in Russia itself, about you know such things as Moscow as a city compared to the rest of the country, or about how. Um, they feel about you know some of the events going on in the far east of, of Russia. So I think that what we're trying to do here in, in our in our way in our field, which is history, is to sort of add to that and say that the even the relationship during you know the past three centuries um, is more complex. And so we're trying to bring clarity by showing um, that it was, it was actually something. Um, that wasn't as simple as sometimes it appears to people today on the news. And I, this part of this is sparked by when I teach my Russian history class here at College of DuPage, I have students who enter the class and will have all kinds of, you know, stereotypes of Russians in their minds and the way they they view Putin and, and the government. Um, and I think sometimes that when they finish the class, at least I hope, um, that they've come to understand that it's much more, there's much more nuance to it and much more complicated. And it's not simply the eight or 10 seconds they see on television. Thank you. Uh, One of the reasons I'm doing the program is to show uh, the listening audience that there's lessons that we can learn by examining a story about another country that on one level may sound very different from our lives here in the United States. But on the other hand, uh, some of the broad themes, and especially since the election, are becoming more uh, relatable and relevant. What are your thoughts on uh, the themes that you see in, in Putin's Russia in particular? Because that really is, you know, now almost you know, 17 years of more or less continuous rule. And how does that uh, compare to what we could see, have seen in the United States? What are the parallels uh, between Russia and, and American? What are the common themes i think one of the themes can be um sort of the uh, a state power the power of a government and, and a state uh, we've seen over the past 16 or almost 17 years now in uh putin's russia as we call it maybe um that the role of the state has changed pretty fundamentally from what it was under certainly boris yeltsin in the 1990s and um Amer- a lot of americans believe that, you know, Putin verges on being a a dictator of sorts. Um, But that's because I think it comes from our understanding of what a state is. And so what I think what this kind of analysis or investigation can do is sort of look at the more complicated realities of what a state is. So that's one theme I I think of. The second theme I think of in terms of current issues between the two countries is the role of our influence outside of our borders. And so um, that's one of the things I think makes uh, the relationship the most tense these days from the expansion of NATO into um, parts of um, Eastern Europe, what was once Eastern Europe and um, former Soviet states, and um, and then the role of a country like Russia in, involved in um, places like Syria. And so I think that those themes are things that um, are, are really driving a lot of the relationship today, uh, it seems to me. You're listening to WSUW 91.7 FM. This is Rashkin Report. I'm your host, Yuri Rashkin. My guest today is Dr. Ben Wisenhunt, uh, professor of history at College of DuPage. Uh, professor, there's another project that you're working on that sounds pretty exciting. You're pulling together and republishing books written by Americans about the Soviet Revolution of 1917. 
Yes. That that sounds a uh, um, very uh, c- creative, unusual, and interesting at the same time. Tell tell, tell us more. Well, I'm, 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 uh, as we're kind of knee deep in it now, I'm not sure that it's any of those things, but um, I appreciate that. Um, it's called the Americans in Revolutionary Russia, and I'm one of the co-editors along with uh, Norman Saul. And I always like to mention that Norman Saul is my co-managing editor of the journal. And just a, a note about him: Norman Saul is a uh, emeritus professor of history from the University of Kansas, and he has written over the past maybe 30 years or so some of the most important books in this Russian-American field that really sort of lay the groundwork for academics who want to go back and look at uh, many of these stories and episodes between the two countries going all the way back to the 18th century. And so he's my partner in both of these, uh, both of these projects. But the Americans of Revolutionary Russia is going to be published, or we are publishing them with Slavica Publishers, which is at Indiana University. And the first two volumes should be out in January, in about a month or so, a little more than a month. And what we're doing is we are taking firsthand accounts by Americans who were in uh, Revolutionary Russia, broadly speaking. We put the dates roughly between 1914, beginning of World War I, and 1921, and who wrote about it. And so all these books were published before 1923 or 1923 and before. So they are in the, um, there's a, they're in the, um, public public domain, public domain. Thank you. I come to the thing of the word public domain. And so we are, um, professor Saul and I are both doing two of the books ourselves. And then we have contracted about 15 other scholars around the United States and in Russia to do um, about a total of about 20 books between now and 2018. Um, the most famous of these books is uh, John Reed's 10 Days That Shook the World. It was published in 1919. But what we're doing, though, is we're adding an introduction that explains sort of the context of the book, the, who the author is, what they were doing there. And then we are annotating the text itself putting in footnotes into the text where we think um, today's reader would need some help in understanding this this world. And then we're also adding indexes to these as well. So, okay, so I understand that so you're taking materials from 1914 to 21 mm-hmm. written by, is this Americans or English speakers? Uh, Americans, Americans. Americans only. Americans authors. Mm-hmm. And then you, but you're also reaching out to, is it editors or writers uh, elsewhere? What, what's the second part of that? Well, the second part is, so, so I've done two, I've done two of these and we have reached out to uh, people we know, actually like Ivan Kurilla, Ivan Kurilla is one of them, um, who mm-hmm. is going to take on one of the books and he will write an introduction. He will annotate the text of his book that he's chosen to do and provide an index. Oh, I see. So it's so it's so this is a perspective, w- and and the edits are coming from today's uh, yeah. specialists, right? So today's specialists on Russian American relations um, across the United States and in and in Russia are going to be offering basically the context through the introductory material and also through the footnoting of the the person's original text from the nineteen teens or twenties. Yes. Well. I'm kind of trying to figure out on one hand the the audience that you're thinking, but I'm even more interested about, um, I presume you've read all of these. And uh, again, what are some of the broad themes that are that have emerged and that you think will be interesting to today's reader? Well, the two I've worked on, just I'll, I'll talk about this in two different ways. The two I've worked on um, are, one, one is by John Reed, 10 Days That Shook the World, and that should be out probably in the summer of next year. And the other one that should be out in January that I worked on is by Albert Reese Williams. And so when you, when you really look at all these books, the first thing you come to the conclusion is, is that they are, um, very different perspectives. So some of these people are diplomats. Some of these people are military people. Some of these people are associated with the YMCA. Some of them are sympathetic journalists. There are men and women alike who are are involved in this. We have about maybe a third of the books are by women. And so it's, they're very different perspectives. But the one thing that strikes me about it is, from, especially from some of the earliest accounts, people who were there in the very beginning as the revolution took place, is that the relationship between these Americans who observed it, even people who weren't that thrilled about the revolution itself, is that they had very positive views of Russia, um, that they were actually quite optimistic about um, the long-term relationship between Russia and the United States. And they did not necessarily feel like that the relationship was going to go uh, was going to sour 
And I think that's an interesting sort of approach to see, or an interesting um, thing to see in these books right away, is that this wasn't necessarily um, viewed as an anti-American, um, certainly, um, revolution. Is it because uh, Russia, prior to you know Soviet Revolution, well, had a good relations with America, and therefore these were expected to continue? Um, is is that kind of part of the basis for that, or because you feel that the author himself felt like the public was pro-American? I mean, what what kind of uh, was responsible for that attitude? It seems that you know, for most of the author, most of these these original authors from a hundred years ago, that they were um, seeing this in some way, sort of out of the context of being related to the United States, that it wouldn't really necessarily affect them directly in the United States. Um, in, the, in this initial moment of the revolutionary period, as time goes on and you start to read later accounts that are written more in 19, 1920, 21 and 22 and 23, those become more um, negative. They become more critical. So I think what they were looking at was um, sort of they took the Russian Revolution for itself and did not necessarily think of it as a broader um, international event in the beginning. But as time goes, you- and as time goes on, though, it does sort of seem to go that way. Does it feel that the revolution was welcomed by the foreigners in Russia at the time? Um, it, it it completely depends on which one you read. <laughs> um, okay. So, for example, I, I was I'm working on John Reed and Albert Reese Williams, and those two with two others, Louise Bryant, who of course was the wife of John Reed, and Bessie Beatty, who was a journalist from California. They are actually very politically sympathetic to the Russian Revolution itself. So their accounts come off very positively about the Russian Revolution, what it is, what it could be, what it might be for the world. But you read others, and they're very critical. Some from ambassadors in the United States, American ambassadors who are there, and they're very critical, and they sort of warn that warn that this is sort of the the new evil that's encroaching in the world. So there's not one view, and I think that's one of the strengths of our series is that it actually gives you a wide range of viewpoints of the, uh, from Americans uh, at the very moment that it happened. As you mentioned earlier in our conversation, we're coming up on a 100-year anniversary of the Soviet Revolution of uh, 1917. Do you see any historical parallels between 1916 and 2017? I mean, uh, Putin seems as entrenched as ever. And uh, at this point, as the last parliament elections in Russia have showed, uh, there will not be peaceful transition of power because those elections just solidified uh, Kremlin's control over the situation of a you know legislative branch. Do you feel that there are uh, parallels uh, between the, the two anniversary, you know, between the two dates? Well, I would only say in sort of one way, um, and that is that in, in 19, you know, 12, 13, all the way to 1916 or so, to the outside world, the Russian monarchy seemed um, undefeatable in a certain way. It seemed to be it's a large monolithic. They, they had just celebrated their 300th anniversary of the Romanov dynasty in 1913 before the war began. And it seemed, at least to the public and the outside world, to be somewhat untouchable. Um, what we learned through the course of World War I, of course, was that um, it wasn't. That actually it was rather fragile and that the, it, it, its control of the country was not um, nearly as strong as what was perceived by the outside world. Um, I suppose that could be somewhat true today as well. The key difference, of course, today is, is we don't have a, a war of that magnitude that would – um, je- jeopardize Putin's con- Putin's control, right? Because all the wars that Russia is engaged in currently are more of a hybrid, yeah. as they keep saying, and uh, they they seem to be something that doesn't, um, as you said, doesn't endanger the the regime. So, right. um, Professor, thank you so much for your time. Anything in conclusion that you would like to make sure that the listeners uh, know about? Uh, either the project you're working on or anything else? Um, no, I just appreciate your time very much. And um, if you have, you know, please look for our journal online. And um, these books hopefully will be coming out in about a, another month or six weeks. And uh, it'll continue on for until 2018 or so, hopefully having a nice collection of 20 books from Slavica publishers. And that... Dr. Ben Wisenhut, professor of history at College of DuPage. 
Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. You're listening to 91.7 FM, WSUW, in Whitewater, Wisconsin. You're listening to Rashkin Report.